Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Lewis Showers coming to you from Grace Baptist Church here in Washington, Indiana. You'll find us located in a red brick building up on a hill behind Bob's Pizza right off of State Road 57. We would really count it a privilege if you would come out and visit with us and participate in our public worship. At 9.30, we have a Sunday school hour, which is then followed by our morning worship service at 10.30. We would really consider it a privilege if you would come and visit with us. So I hope you'll take this invitation seriously and come on out and find out what are the benefits of attending Grace Baptist Church. Now, in the meantime, you say, I want to know more about what the church stands for or a little bit more about the church, or you have some questions regarding the Bible, or you want to dig into the Bible even further, we would invite you to our interactive website. You can get to our website by just typing in Grace Baptist Church, Washington, Indiana, or you can use our domain name, gbcwashingtonin.com. In either case, as you come into our website, you will find there are a number of valuable resources and so forth that are on our website that can be of help to you. There are a number of audio messages and even some video messages relating to books of the Bible or topics of the Bible. Likewise, there are some articles written on subjects that many individuals have questions about. And they are documented with scripture and give good biblical answers to the questions that are on people's minds. So I hope that you'll take a few minutes and come in and visit us on the website. But more importantly, we hope that you'll come and visit with us personally by coming out to our worship service on Sunday. Please take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, actually, with the subject we're going to be talking about here today, you could go to a number of different places in the book of Romans and uh, find passages which speak about the subject. Because actually the theme of the book of Romans, the main theme that Paul wants to drive home is we are justified by faith. And that idea keeps getting brought over and over and over so that by the time you're done with reading the book of Romans, you should be of no question about what God has said regarding our justification. In Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, did you catch that word? No what? Condemnation. Condemnation. In other words, there's nothing left from which you can be condemned. Wow, that's a wonderful truth. And why is that the case? Because in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I've been set free from those. Wow. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit and so we want to talk this morning about the matter of justification father we pray that you will bless this message this morning i pray the holy spirit will truly be in charge giving power enablement conviction change all the things that the holy spirit would have and lord most importantly May we worship the God who created us all. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I don't know about you, but when I call up to the pharmacy uh, and I need a medication, oftentimes I kind of hesitate to give the name of the medication because the name of those medications can be pretty hard to pronounce. I, uh, have talked with some who work in a pharmacy and I've also talked with some others who deal with medication and I say, how do you know how to pronounce these medicines? And they say to me, 
Oh, well, sometimes we don't know how to pronounce it, so we just wing it. Well, <laughs> those names, I'm sure, have a significant reason why they were named, given the name that they are, the medications. But believe it or not, I have no clue as to why. Why they can't just say, okay, this is so-and-so, nice, easy name, this is the brand name, or this is the generic, would it make so much easier? When we come to the scriptures, we find that when we talk about biblical issues, sometimes they're assigned big words. And sometimes it's difficult to understand what those words mean. Justification, I think, is one of those words. Though it is used commonly in the scriptures, particularly in the books of Paul, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, his uh, epistles to the churches, justification is continually hammered home. And so I think for us as Christians, if it's that important that God mentions it many times in the scripture, then we ought to know what that means, that we are justified by faith. Now in our doctrinal statement, I'm going to look at two different parts of our doctrinal statement. The latter part we're just going to touch on just briefly and then we're going to go on and spend most of our time on the first part. On justification, we believe that the great gospel which Christ secures to such as believe in him is justification. Justification includes the pardon of sin and the gift of eternal life on principles of righteousness. In other words, our pardon and our eternal life have their basis upon us being righteous. You say, whoa, how did I become righteous? I mean, after all, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Well, he goes on to tell us here in this uh, doctrine statement, that is bestowed not in consideration of any works of righteousness which we have done, but solely through faith in the Redeemer's blood, His, and I want you to note this, His righteousness is imputed to us. So our pardon, our eternal security, and all of these things are due to the fact of not what I have done or any religious works that I have accomplished, but rather it is totally in what Christ has done and in His righteousness I have received my pardon and eternal life. We'll expand on that a little bit more. The second part is of faith and salvation. We believe that faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only condition of salvation. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only condition of salvation. Now when we talk about this doctrine of faith and salvation, I'm not going to spend very much time on it. Because we've already pretty well covered that in previous messages in this series. I do want to focus in on one part of it though. This teaching that salvation comes by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ and faith alone. This teaching separates those who are of true Christianity and those who are of false Christianity. Amen. Uh, we don't like to think of it that way. I received this nice envelope with a bunch of nice material inside and uh, I opened it up, looked at it, and, and uh, what they're basically saying is we want to get all branches of Christianity, regardless of denomination and background, we want to get them all together united because that's what the Lord wants. But there's a problem with that. Because some of those branches of Christianity preach of salvation apart from faith alone in Christ. And so Paul gave this test for believers to use to know what really does represent Jesus Christ and what only says it represents Jesus Christ. Now we note this as it was given in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Notice what he says here in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. Whoops. I don't know how that got in there. Well, we go back. Go back there for just a minute, Mary. 
If any church preach salvation comes through Christ plus anything else, they preach a gospel other than the gospel of the scriptures. Okay? So, if they preach anything other than salvation by faith, if they add anything to it, they preach a gospel other than the gospel of scripture, and they truly do not represent Jesus Christ. And so let's apply that test as the Apostle Paul gives it now in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. He writes this, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. In other words, his point is you're going after this other gospel, but it's really not a real gospel. It falls. There's no legitimacy to it. To a different gospel which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to what? Prevert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, that is justification by faith, let that individual be what? A curse. Let them be damned to hell, is what he said. Those are strong words, but he makes it even stronger. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that which you receive, let him be accursed. <coughs> Paul is very clear on this matter. If they don't preach the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith alone, they're not of God. Now, they may agree with us on a lot of different things. They may agree on the Trinity of God. They may agree on a lot of different things, the virgin birth, whatever. But if they do not preach salvation by faith through grace alone, they don't truly represent God. And Paul says, let them be accursed. They're going to do that. They are perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we need to keep that in mind then, that this is the determining factor on which groups, churches, or believers that we will worship with and which ones we will not. It is for this very reason that the local town ministerium, which has invited me to be a part of it, I will not be a part of it. And you say, well, aren't you being a little bit snobbish by not being involved with it? No. The reason I won't get involved with it is because some of those who are involved in this ministerium preach salvation plus works, plus baptism, plus the church, plus religious works, plus, and I can go down and name all kinds of other things. And they deny what the gospel declares, that salvation comes through Jesus Christ and him alone by grace through faith. And that out of ourselves. Okay, now sit on that. When we deal with the doctrine of justification, I want you to think of the word righteousness. Can justification and righteousness go hand in hand? We saw that in the doctrinal statement. The word justification comes from the Greek word, which means to be righteous. And righteous only means to be right with the law. So if you have a righteous person, they're innocent before the law. They have fulfilled the law. They have completed the law. They have not violated the law. This is the reason why we call God a righteous God. Because we know that God never has nor ever will sin. He is perfect in his fulfillment of his law. Therefore, he is right with his law. That's what righteousness means. Now, we can get an idea of this in Deuteronomy chapter 25. And this righteousness is used not only in relation to God, but in the Bible it's also used in relationship to interactions between one individual and another. For example, in Deuteronomy 25, verses 1 through 2, if there is a dispute between men, okay, so they come to the court, 
that the judges may judge them, that they may justify who? Now what's righteousness mean? The one that's kept the law from the condemned one, the wicked one, who has broken the law. So it was the judge's job to figure out who is right with the law and who is wrong with the law. And the righteous one will go free, and the unrighteous one, the breaker of the law, will be condemned to whatever judgment was to be applied for that breaking of the law. And so we find that that's how the term was used in secular senses. Now, in the biblical sense, it speaks of being totally right with the moral law of God. In other words, we become, in a sense, on the, well, we don't become, but we, we arise to the level of God in the matter of law-keeping. Now, please don't take it wrong. I'm not saying that we become God or <laughs> get on an on a equal level with our God because there's no way we can be equal to God. But in the issue of righteousness, which deals with being right with the law, when we become justified, this is a part of the process that God has wrought through Jesus Christ that will eventually make us like God in the sense that we will be 100% right with God's moral law and we will ever be righteous, right with God's moral law. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm looking forward to that day. I'm tired of wrestling with sin. I long for the day in which sin will not be even mentioned or thought of. For all that I do, and all that I say, and all that I think will be right with the law of God, even as it is with God himself. So in the biblical sense, it means that when we are justified, we are made right with the law. Nothing stands against us. We have been declared innocent of sin. We stand before God as He has justified us before Him. We stand before Him as innocent as Adam and Eve were when they were originally created. Nothing stands between us and the law as far as God is concerned. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Sin and death no longer have any dominion over us. We have been justified by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. That's Romans chapter 4, verse 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Hey, that's us. We were the ungodly and we have been justified. His faith is accounted, what's the word? For righteousness, his count, you know, he, he, he gives us this uh, thing, that he, this faith is accounted for being right with the law, 100%. This is what God has done for us. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes rightness with the law, <laughs> apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered, and blesses a man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. God will never, ever impute sin, or reckon sin toward us as individuals, because we stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And because of that, all of our sins have been pardoned. They've been erased in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so when we stand before God, we stand as those who are totally 100% right with the law of God. And that's an amazing, amazing thing. Now, the word justification as it relates to the believer's life is not a static thing. I mean, by static is 
it's not something that just stays the same, but rather it is something that changes. In fact, there are three stages to justification in the life of every believer. Now let's just quickly take a look at these stages. Stage number one, the past condition prior to salvation. In that condition, we were in unrighteousness. We were born in the image of Adam and Eve. We therefore inherited their sin nature. We therefore were unrighteous. We were continually violating, breaking the moral law of God. And because of this condition, the full weight of God's punishment of sin stood against us. And we merely were waiting here on this earth for the inevitable day of our death and the eternal imprisonment that comes with it as an unbeliever. I think of an uh, illustration that came from Edgar Allan Poe's one of his books, The Pit and the Pendulum. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. This is a picture of all unbelievers. The blade goes back and forth, and each time it goes back and forth, it drops a little bit. Now, the victim doesn't know exactly the timing in which that blade will drop just low enough that it will begin to inflict damage. One thing he does know is he's strapped down and there's no way he can escape. The pendulum goes back and forth, even as unbelievers who are living in their unrighteous state, the wrath of God is swinging over top of them. They don't know when they're going to, it's going to make its first full impact at the moment of death. But they do know this, it's coming, and there's nothing they can do to change it. This is where we were prior to Jesus Christ. And that's why it says in Ephesians 2, verse 3, we were by nature the children of wrath, just as the others were. Ah, but there's good news. There's the present condition of justification. That is, since we've been saved, the moment we put our faith in Christ for our salvation, we were declared justified by God. It was like that picture we showed there with the pendulum. It's like someone coming in and taking a knife and cutting all the straps and removing us away from the danger and taking us out of that uh, dungeon of torment and freeing us. The wrath of God no longer hangs over us. Rather, we look forward to the eternal life that waits for us. That's the present condition of man. That is the present condition, I should say, of all believing men and women. For some since salvation, that moment that we put our faith in Christ, the wrath of God was removed forever. You don't need to fear the wrath of God if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I can, judge, I can, you know, prove this point. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. So you put your faith, then you are justified. Justified is a, what? Past tense verb. So in other words, at the moment of faith, you are then justified. So as we look back at our salvation, we're looking back at a moment in which that justification became a part of us and we became righteous before God. Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by faith, we now have what with God? We're at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the wrath of God will never fall upon us because God's wrath only falls on his enemies. He's at peace with us. We're no longer his enemies. We're now his children. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. So at the moment of salvation, we are made righteous before the Lord. Now, I want us to note that though we still have a fallen nature, and we still sin. God's justification has been added to our lives 
resulting in several significant changes. All right, let's note something. We have been justified, and so when we go before God, sin is no longer standing between us and God. But in our present condition in this life, we still have a sin nature. And that sin nature still causes us to sin and break the moral law of God. But we are justified. So what has happened? I mean, what's all this going on? Well, you know, the full justification is going to happen in the future when we see the Lord. In the meantime, though, there are some changes that have taken place through this justification that we can now see evident in our lives. Let me give them to you. Number one, we now have a pardon. Any of you used to play Monopoly? Maybe some of you still do. We got a out of jail for how much? Free. We've received the pardon from God himself. President Trump has been catching a lot of news lately about all the people he has pardoned since he's taken office. That's what a pardon is. He says to the one who's been sentenced to jail and he's now languishing in jail, he says, your whole thing has been erased and you are now as if you had never done it and you are now free. That's a pardon. And that's a pardon that God has given us. And that is true even though while we still go on in these bodies, we still sin. As far as our eternal destiny, no sin will ever, ever have any impact on our eternal destiny. Because those sins which condemned us to death and hell have been pardoned. They will never longer, ever, stand against us. And that pardon, by the way, is an eternal pardon. It didn't just cover the sins we had at the moment we put our faith and trust in Christ. It covered all the sins that we would commit from that time until we see Jesus, when we are made finally, completely, the righteous work of God. So all of our sins, past, present, and future, we're all covered under faith in Christ. Something else that happened when we were justified. We went from being enemies of God to the children of God. Therefore, we have intercession to the throne of God. God promises every believer because they're justified. God says, you can come on in the throne anytime. In fact, God says, I want you to come into my throne all the time. I want you to spend time talking with me. I want you to spend time meditating in my word and communing with me. You're my children. As my children, I want to spend time with you. Boy, what a difference that makes between before we accepted Christ and after. Before we accepted Christ, we were the enemies of God. God never promises anyone who is an unbeliever he will answer their prayer. However, those of us who are believers, he says, every believer that comes to me and seeks my help, I promise I will what? Answer them. Now, before you get too far and start saying, Lord, there's that red mustang. Russ, don't start praying that way. And think that that means tomorrow you're going to get one. Okay? Uh, just because you want this or want that or whatever, and you say, I can go into the throne of God and I can ask whatever I want, and He'll answer me. Just remember, there are two answers. One is yes, and the other one is no. He may answer you no. But the important thing here is to know is this, number one, if he says a no to you, he is doing it for your very best. And number two, 
If he says no, it means he's been what? Listening to you, considering your request, and cares enough to make the right decision. And that's all we can ask of God, isn't it? But every time we go to heaven, God stops to listen. It doesn't matter whether it's in the middle of the day or at 3 o'clock in the morning. God wants to hear from us. Something else that happens at justification. God's presence, the Holy Spirit, begins to dwell within us. He is a companion, a comforter, an enabler, a guide, an interpreter, an intercessor, and so much more. We indeed are blessed to have the Holy Spirit to be a part of our daily lives. The fourth thing that comes into our lives is chastisement. You say, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about blessings here. I thought being justified and the righteousness of God being applied to me, I thought this was supposed to be a positive thing. It is. And chastisement is positive, not negative. Believe me, my parents applied chastisement to me when I was a child. Some of you went through the same thing. And uh, that chastisement, well, tell me about this. I never went up to my dad, especially my dad, or my mom, and said to him, hey, would you spank me? Would you take away some of my privileges? Would you ground me? I never once said that. But looking back at what they did, I thank God they did it. Why? Because now, with wisdom, I can see that the chastening hand that they applied to my life enabled me to be a better person. You see, when it comes to the chastisement of God, I said that even though we are justified and our eternal destiny is sealed because you know, when it comes to the matter of eternal destiny, our sins are wiped out, yet in this present life we are still sinning. But justification means that when we sin, God deals with it differently than when the unbeliever sins. And the difference really comes down to the fact that when we sin in this present condition, it does not go toward our eternal punishment, but rather it merely interferes with our relationship with God. And therefore, God will chasten us in order to bring us back into right relationship. He chases us out of love, for he desires us to repent of our sins and to run back to him and say, I'm sorry, and his arms can be put around us. It's like the difference here between a parent spanking their child. Hopefully they're doing it out of love. The goal is to produce a good, healthy child. However, for those who are unbelievers, when they sin, God doesn't chasten them. You know what God does when an unbeliever sins? He just adds it to the total amount of sins that will stand against them at the judgment day. And they will not receive chastisement, but rather they will receive punishment. You know, we talk about spanking children, and that's a quote-unquote wrong thing to do today. Man, I'll tell you what, when I go to Walmart, some of these stores, and I see the way some of these kids act, I think that in itself should be plenty of justification as to why spanking needs to be once again reimposed. And it should be okay in public, if necessary. But, I do not believe parents should punish their children. See, there's a difference. When the child is spanked by a parent, the goal is out of love, 
to help the child be better. But when we send a prisoner to jail and we punish him, all we are thinking about doing is making him pay for what he has done. Nothing is said about, well, whether he'll reform or not. He's just going to have to pay his time. And so it is with sin. God chastens those who are his. Those who are righteous in his eyes, he chastens them. Why? Because he wants to remove that disobedient from their hearts so they might be in right relationship with him. But for those who are unbelievers... It goes toward their eternal destiny. That is the difference. Listen to what Paul says, or not, I should say Paul. I think Paul wrote Hebrews, by the way, but uh, it doesn't say for certain, so we've got to be right on this. But the writer of Hebrews puts it this way. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And he scourges every son whom he receives. Yeah, we still have that fallen nature. And yes, we have not yet realized the full impact of the righteousness for Jesus Christ that he applied to us. But it is being metered out in the way that God shows his love and the chastening of us and chastening of our lives. That we might be closer and more like him. Now, there are some Christians who have the wrong idea. They think that because they're righteous now, then they no longer sin. I've had a few conversations with them. They're ignoring what John writes in his first epistle to believers. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive whom? Ourselves. Deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. <laughs> We're not deceiving anybody else. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's willing to get that roadblock out that's standing between me and him in our relationship, not in our eternal destiny. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we find that that's the way it works. Yes, sinners and believers alike sin. But there's a world of difference between the way God deals with the believer in sin and God deals with the unbeliever in sin. Last thing I want to touch on here this morning. What is our future condition? Well, the future condition is this. The justifying work of God will be completed in us when we see Christ. And though we will be judged by Christ, every believer is going to be judged by Christ at the Bema Seat Judgment, rest assured, your judgment will not be based upon your sins. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but that makes me feel wonderful. Because, you see, he won't be judging us based on our sins because our sins have been what? wiped away. What we will be judged on is our works, on how we serve the Lord, how we took up the, you know, uh, took advantage of the resources that God gave us, how we share the gospel or didn't share the gospel, what we did for the Lord, that will be the criteria of our judgment. And then once we're through the judgment, then the Lord then of course returns and sets up his kingdom and Finally, the end of that kingdom, the world passes away, and we enter into a new heaven, a new earth. Guess what happens? Listen to what Revelation 21 says. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. Did you catch that? Why isn't God dwelling with us right now? Because of our sin, sinful condition of humanity. But in that day and time, because we are totally righteous and we will be made righteous and our fallen nature will be gone and so everything that we desire to do will be righteous, everything that we think will be righteous, everything that we do will be righteous and God, can, a righteous God, can dwell among us. Wow. 
that's, that's a marvelous thought. And God will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away, notice, every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have what? Passed away. All the things that we've had to suffer and endure and put up with in this life can all be traced back to the fall of Adam and Eve. And Jesus Christ came to erase that from our lives. And when he creates that new heaven and new earth, all those things are gone. There will be no sin ever, ever, ever again in that new earth and that new heaven. We will be perfect living in a perfect world. Life, life will be on a level so exciting and it'll be far greater than the very best day. Think of the very best day you ever lived and multiply it tenfold and that'll be the worst day you have in your and you know how you feel when you get out of bed? I know how I felt when I got out of bed this morning, having worked on that bathroom this week. I moaned and I groaned, and I even prayed and asked the Lord, could not this be Saturday instead of Sunday? And God says, no, you're going to pay the price for what you did. And so I'm here. But in that day and time, when we wake in the morning, we'll be ready to go. Why? Because sin is gone. He finishes it up in Revelation 21, verse 8. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, <coughs> all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now, where are, they, where are those who are committing those sins going? The lake of fire. With brimstone, which is the second death. Now, please, don't misunderstand this verse. This doesn't mean that if somebody is sexually immoral in this life, then they're going to hell, regardless. Many who have been sexually immoral in this life will be in heaven. Those who have been sorcerers, some of them have been regenerated and saved by faith and justified, they will be in heaven. What it is saying is this. You won't find any of these things, these practices, going on in heaven. For heaven is a no-sin zone. And so is that new earth. We will be redeemed, righteous in the eyes of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Christians, we can gather so much peace and hope and joy from knowing that before the Lord we have been justified. We need not fear what tomorrow may hold because we are justified in Jesus Christ. Therefore, we know that regardless of whatever happens, we know that the day is coming in which it will be undone. And we will be made like him. We do not need to fear that we might somehow sin and lose our salvation and then, well, we die and we go to hell. That ain't going to happen because you are justified. That's a one-time event that happens at the moment of salvation. You're free of death. You're free of sin. You are righteous in God's eyes regarding your eternal destiny. I hope these words are comforting words to you. What a wonderful God who cares so much for us that he knew we couldn't justify ourselves in our own doing. He came and he did the work for us. And we will stand before the Lord and if he says, why should I let you into heaven? We will say, because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ was applied to my life. And he will say, welcome in. Welcome. Father, I pray that you would be with all that are here this morning. And as we've looked at this important doctrine, justification, I pray that it has been something that has helped us better understand this idea of righteousness. Though it has not been fully applied until the day in which we see Jesus, yet it is at work in our lives. 
We have already received our pardon, so we don't need to fear we're going to go to hell. We uh, are now a part of the children of God, therefore we now have access to the Father that we never had before. We know that though we still have a sin nature and sin, yet you're there and faithful to forgive us and restore us. We want to thank you, Father, for that. Help us to respond to that chastening work. And where there needs to be change in our lives, may you bring about that change. Help us to take this message out to the world. But there are many in this world, even some who call themselves Christians, who need to hear the truth. That salvation comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the one and true way. And we pray this in your name.